All right, hi everyone, and thank you so much for uh, you know being here and for uh, sticking around till the end of the day. I know it's been like a really awesome day with lots of great information, lots of talks, and yeah, so I'm happy to be the one to kind of do the last talk of the day before we all go and have a great party, right? Woo! <laughs> All right, so my name is John. I'm primarily an iOS developer. I work for a Norwegian startup called Motimate, where we're trying to make online corporate training a little bit more fun. It doesn't sound very fun in the name, but we're trying to make it more fun and more accessible to other people. Uh, but besides that, I do a lot of sharing. I share a lot of the work that I do, and I work a lot on stuff like blogging, podcasting, open source work, I'm very active on social media and things like that. So that's exactly what I want to talk about today. And this is actually going to be my very first non-technical talk ever. So I'm a little bit nervous, uh, but I hope you're going to like it. So uh, why do I want to do this talk? Well, I've been sharing things now for quite a lot of years, about five, six years, something like that. Uh, but it's only been in the last like 12 or 13 months that things have kind of started taking off and a lot of people have started to notice what it is that I'm sharing. So because of that, a lot of people are under the impression that I only started one year ago and that I somehow, I don't know, by some miracle or di divine intervention was able to kind of get things right on the first attempt. Well, like with so many things, there's like a long backstory behind it. So today I want to tell you a little bit about that story and also how I learned a lot of things along the way and to share some of those learnings with you so that hopefully if you want to share more things either today or later in the future, that you can learn from some of my mistakes so you don't have to make at least the exact same ones. So to get started, we need to jump back a couple of years back, all the way to ancient history to 2013, when the dinosaurs were still walking on Earth, right? In 2013, something really big happened to me. I started working for Spotify. Spotify was a really, really great company to work for, and I was working there for about three and a half years. And it really changed in many ways the way I work and the way I think about programming in general. I met a lot of amazing developers that really inspired me, and I got to learn so many new things. But one thing in particular that I came in contact with for the first time was open source. Now, I had worked with open source a bit before as a user. I had used open source projects. I had looked at GitHub and things like that. But I always thought that open source was something that was reserved for like the very best developers, like the super smart people who would think of these amazing projects and they would code it in like two hours, put it on GitHub. It was amazing, you know, super revolutionary. That's kind of how I viewed open source. And so I never thought that me, you know, a mere mortal, could actually write these things or actually contribute to the open source community. But when I was working in Spotify, this really changed. Because what I noticed was that a lot of people who were working there, they also were working on open source projects in their spare time, and the company itself was heavily invested in open source. So the mindset seemed to be very, very different from the one I had since before. The mindset was basically that if you have any piece of code that is reusable in any way and that other people could use, well, you should open source it. And this was very, very different from the way I was thinking about things as this like, kind of big thing that you had to be some special person to do. So this really empowered me and made me feel like this is something that I can do myself. So I went back to my app and checked, do I have any components in my app that I can actually share and actually put on GitHub? And so I find one, and it was called JS Update Lookup. It was just a single class that I shared on GitHub. And it didn't end up changing the world at all, but it was a very, very simple thing. What it was was a lightweight, easy, easy to use way to check if your iOS app has an update available on the App Store. And then you could display like a dialog to say, hey, there's an update available, maybe you want to download it. It was something that worked really well for me, and I was sharing it already in a couple of different projects, so I thought, why not just publish it and share it with other people? Now, this didn't really end up going anywhere because, well, it was only one contributor, and that's me. And as you can see, the last update was four years ago. So it's not really an actively maintained project. And there's only two people watching it, and one of them is me. So yeah, I want to thank the other person, wherever he or she is, for actually watching this project. Maybe someday there will be an update, right? But the important thing is that this project didn't, like, it wasn't revolutionary, it didn't end up becoming, you know, the next big thing, but it was very, very important to me. It showed me that I can actually just publish something with a simple git push, it ends up on GitHub, and it becomes an open source project. 
And these kind of learnings and this new gained confidence, I could use later when Swift would come out, and I would create my very first Swift open source project called Unbox. By then, I had learned so much more how it is to work with open source, API design, and things like that, and I was able to make a much, much better project that ended up being more used by many, many people. This time, what I wanted to create was a simple, easy-to-use JSON decoder, and this is something that most languages, including Swift these days, has built in. But back then, when Swift was brand new, it was not easy to do it. And therefore, I saw a problem that I had myself, I addressed it, and I addressed it in a more general way, and I published it for other people to use. Now, this time around, I didn't only have one contributor. At this point in time, there are actually 30 contributors to this project, so it has been a lot, lot more you know, bigger and more widely used. But I really, really believe that I wouldn't be able to make Unbox this way if I didn't start with JS Update Lookup and lots of the other projects that I did in between that didn't end up going anywhere, but gave me the confidence and gave me the experience to actually do something like this. Open source has really kind of fundamentally changed the way I look at programming. And these days, it's like if, I, if I'm writing something which I can't open source, it kind of feels like it's a little bit invisible. It feels like, you know, if I can't share it with other people, then, you know, where is it? It's kind of unknown. It doesn't exist almost. It's gone like so far that this is kind of the way I feel about programming, that I still write closed source code, but it's only because I have to, because of business reasons, because of customers and NDAs but I always want to write open source code because I want to. I really enjoy to do it. So this is one aspect of how I got started with sharing. Another thing that I started looking into was blogging. So like many other iOS developers, I learned so much about what I do and you know, how to write an iOS app by reading a lot of amazing blogs. Blogs like Ray Vandelick, NS Hipster, and Objective-C.io were really the things that I used to learn iOS development to begin with. So naturally, during the years, I started thinking, well, maybe I should write a blog as well. Everyone else seems to do it, so maybe I should do too. So I went to GitHub, I created one of these GitHub pages, and I created a website using that called Sundell Swift. You know, there was my Swift, I was going to write about it, and it's going to be amazing. So I wrote one blog post, it was about code encapsulation, very simple one. I even had a syntax error here in the, in the code sample, so really good start. And then the next week, the week after, I wrote another post, and I was like, yeah, I'm on a roll. And then I never wrote another blog post again. <laughs> and this is something that I hear is very common, because it's so hard to find like, a good consistency and good motivation when it comes to writing blog posts. So this was in 2015, and then two years would go by, and then something would happen where I made this little tweet where I basically took a screenshot of some of my code, I wrote a little description, and I put it on Twitter. And it seemed to, first of all, people kind of liked it and thought it was a good idea to do something like this, but also it kind of sparked my imagination again that maybe I should give this blogging thing a second try, but maybe this time I should be a little bit more organized, a little bit more focused, and I should try to do something you know, a little bit better than what I did last time. So by this point in time, Medium had also come out. And with Medium, there was a very, very easy way to just write things, publish them, and publish them on a big platform. So you didn't have to worry about setting things up or formatting. Things would just look very, very nice. So I ended up writing this Medium post about error handling. So I wrote it, I published it, and it didn't, nothing really happened. It wasn't like, you know, again, it wasn't changing the world or anything, but it really started giving me, again, the confidence that, you know what, maybe I can actually write blog posts. Maybe it's not, again, something that only the most talented, amazing developers in the world can do. Maybe it's something that I can do as well. So I set myself a challenge. I said, last time I tried blogging, I managed to go two weeks writing blog posts, and then that was it. This time, I will try to set myself another challenge to see, can I write one blog post every week? And let's see how many weeks I can keep that up. Well, in the worst case scenario, I'll just do three, and then I've broken my record. That would be great, right? So I felt it was, it was a bit of a crazy challenge, but I felt good about it, because if I only would do it three times, I would at least have a new record and something new to aim for. 
Well, I can't tell you how many weeks I was able to do because I haven't finished yet. I'm actually still writing one blog post every week. In fact, yesterday, I sat down here a couple of hundred meters from this place down in the harbor and wrote my 61st weekly blog post. So it has been a really, really big change for me in the way I work, and I've learned a lot of things along the way that I want to talk to you about today. A couple of months after launching this Medium post, I felt like, you know what, now I've kind of grown a little bit of confidence, and maybe I want to launch my own website. So I created a Squarespace account, and I set up my own website. This time I called it Swift by Sundell, not Sundell's Swift. That's clearly the reason it succeeded. You know, the difference in the name, that makes a ton of difference. And, you know, things have been going from there. Another thing that started to happen after I like, established myself with my blogging and I started getting confident and, and, and I had some regular blog posts coming out, I started thinking about podcasting. Because just like blogging, I had been listening to so many great podcasts from you know, around the world, you know, shows like ATP and The Talk Show and Upgrade, which I still listen to every single week. So I th thought to myself, maybe I should try podcasting as well. You know, why not? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. And because I don't have any imagination when it comes to naming, because we all know naming is really hard, so I just call my podcast, well, guess what? Swift by Sundell. <laughs> Great name, right? And this time, though, it was a little bit scary because it was something brand new. And blogging is something that, you know, most developers have written some blog posts or some documentation at some point, but writing or creating a, a podcast was a really, really scary thing for me. I didn't know so much about it. So I decided I don't want to go into this alone. I want to do it together with other people. So I decided that on each episode, I want to invite a new guest from around the community and talk about Swift, answer people's questions, discuss things, and see where it goes from there. So I've been really, really fortunate to have some really amazing guests over the last year or so. And there's a lot of people here in this room, actually, who have been guests on the show. And I'm really, really happy for that and looking forward to having more guests in the future as well. Now, while this all happened, I came in contact with this guy, one of, the, one of the guests on my show. His name is Guy Rambo, he's a Brazilian iOS developer, and he has also this really nice talent of being able to go into Apple's frameworks and their tools and spelunk them, and find some secrets, find some symbols, and find some things that we can speculate about maybe what Apple might be doing in the future. So together with Guy Rambo, we also decided that, you know what, it would be fun to do a show, another podcast, where we talk about these kind of tech news that happen, but from this perspective. So a couple of weeks ago, we launched Stack Trace, which is a podcast about just that. So as you can see, this journey has happened over like five years or even more. It didn't happen overnight. It's something that I gradually come into, experimenting, trying new things, learning along the way, and seeing what works and what doesn't. So today, I want to share, you the, share with you the learnings from this process. And I want to talk about four different topics around sharing and how I think you, know, you can get started, you can do things, and you can see what will work for you. So let's get started with the first one, which is all about goals. Now, goals is not something you might think about when you think about sharing stuff. You know, you just share stuff because you want to, because it's fun, and that is, of course, very important. But I think it's also very important to set some clear goals or reasons why you want to share things. Because sometimes it's like by default, like, yeah, you should write a blog because you should write a blog, or you should be on Twitter because everyone else is on Twitter. But those are not really good reasons. And let's take a look at how we can actually establish some goals, which will give us a lot more consistency if we want to share things. So I've been thinking a lot about what was the difference between my first attempt and my second attempt at blogging. Why did the first attempt fail, and why did the second one succeed? And no, it was not only about the name. That was, of course, very important too, but not only about the name. So if you think about it from a goal perspective, what was the goals that I had with my first attempt at getting started with blogging? Well, honestly, I didn't really have any goals. And the only reason I really did it was because everyone else is doing it. You know, all the developers that I were following on Twitter or seeing like on podcasts or whatever, they all had blogs. So I thought, well, I should have a blog too, right? But again, that's not really a good reason to do something because it's very hard to stay motivated when your only motivation is that to do something because everyone else is doing something. Now, with my second attempt, things were very, very different. First of all, I had this weekly challenge that I set for myself. 
it become more about the things I want to do for myself than about anyone else. And another thing I did was that I set some really clear constraints. Right from the beginning, I said to myself, if I'm going to be able to do this every single week, then I need to have some constraints. So what I said was, one blog post cannot take more than three hours to write. So from the moment I get started till it's published, that's three hours. And that means I can either cut scope, write about things that are simpler, instead of writing these huge, long things. Now, I mentioned earlier that Open source is really motivating to me because it gives kind of my code a bigger meaning, it lets me work with other people, and it becomes more visible. Now, but with blogging, what I could do is I could more analyze my work that I was doing with closed source code and actually apply some of the learnings to actually write about it and that way be able to share it without actually sharing the code itself. And this kind of gave this closed source code like a second life, like a more motivation to keep learning new things, keep learning new technologies, keep kind of being hungry, and keep sharing things. So what are some kind of goals or motivations that I think could be good examples if you want to start sharing? Well, first of all, you could also do the same thing I did, set yourself a challenge. You don't have to be crazy like I did and set myself a weekly goal. I mean, we have Paul here, he's now doing a post every day up until WWDC. That is even crazier, but you don't have to do that. You can set like yourself a monthly goal, or you could say like every time I finish a feature, I'm going to write about it, like a little postmortem, a little retrospective to share what I learned. Another reason to get started could be to feel this feeling of giving back to the community. I mean, we've all learned so much from blogs and open source projects and things like that, so it feels really good to give back and to share something back. Now, another thing that I think is really, really good to keep in mind when it comes to sharing is that it's a great way to document things. If you had to solve a really, really tricky bug, it's really nice to document that. You can do it for your coworkers, or you could do it for yourself in the future. And if you're already writing this documentation, then why not share it with a wider group of people? You could start by sharing inside of your company, and then later maybe make something public. And again, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You can start small and grow from there. There's this kind of thing, I think, in the tech industry where we feel that in order to be on stage and give a talk or in order to write a blog post, you need to be an expert in this field. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think that learning by teaching is really, really powerful. And I think it has a great value. If you are learning something brand new, you are going to encounter a lot of you know, hard things and have to come over, like learn some caveats in the API. And if you can share those learnings, even if you're not an expert, even if you're a beginner, that is really, really valuable to other people. So these are some of the kind of you know, personal or soft reasons to get started. But it also can have a great impact on you and your company. So uh, sharing things can be a great way to promote your company or your product by making people more interested in kind of under the hood kind of things that are going on and problems that you're solving on a daily basis. You can you know, give, make people more interested in your company or what you do. And as a developer, it's a great way to add value to your resume. If you, you know, are just sharing a couple of things or writing some blog posts or something like that, it adds a ton of value if you're looking for a job later in the future. So, of course, when it comes to these things, there's no real right or wrong, and really what goals you set will be up to you or your situation. There are only really two reasons that I think you should try to avoid when it comes to getting started with sharing, and that is to gain internet points, <laughs> or to try to get a really huge audience. Now, you can get a huge audience, but you shouldn't really have it as the goal, because if you have it as a goal, it's going to be really hard to stay motivated. Because guess what? Every single blog, every single podcast, and every single open source project always started with the same amount of audience, which is zero. So it's really hard to stay motivated if that's your only goal. So I would suggest thinking about other reasons to share things than just these kind of things, even though I know it's fun to measure GitHub stars and that kind of stuff. Speaking of GitHub stars, let's talk about open source. So uh, here are some tips that I have about how to get started sharing your, uh, your code as open source projects. So again, I mentioned earlier that in the beginning, I thought about open source like these big, massive, ambitious projects that had to like change the world and be like, you know, revolutionary. But I've really, really changed my mindset about that. 
These days, the way I look at open source is kind of like this. You know when you got started with app development? You probably wrote all of your code in one single module, or one single package, or whatever it's called in the language you're working on. You might even have do what I did. I wrote my first app in one file. It was all in the app delegate. Best place to put your code, right? So, uh, I, but I learned eventually that, you know what? It is not the best place, and it's not the best practice. Instead, you should probably try to shrink down your app, like the core of the app, and then, you know, a very common practice is to create these, like, modules around the app that all are these, like, more isolated building blocks. And we've heard a lot of talks talking about that today, you know, how to separate it but still have clear interfaces between all these different parts of the system. Now, the way I look at open source is really just like a continuation of this idea. Let's say, take the login code, for example. Let's say we're writing an app where we have to support OAuth as a login mechanism. That's really not something that is tied specifically to our app, but it's something that is more generic, that more or less anyone could use. So the way I look at open source is you identify such a component, which is more like a generic thing, and you simply move it out and make that into an open source project. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that. It's not like cut the code, paste it, git push, ah, done. Open source complete. Of course, it takes a little bit more effort. So what are some things that I think are good to keep in mind? Well, first of all, I think it's good to identify modules that have a clear API that are not really specifically tied to the core logic of your app. I think those are great candidates for open source. And like I mentioned earlier with my JS update lookup, which doesn't stand for JavaScript, by the way. It's my name, John Sundell. For some reason, I thought that was a good way to name things, but yeah. Um, those are great candidates because they are just like an isolated piece of your code. It doesn't really have to do anything with the rest of the code, and they can easily be extracted and put online as an open source project. You can also think about it the other way around. If you have a module that you want to have a more clear API, or you want it to become more decoupled, that's another great reason. Because guess what? If you have it as an open source project, you can't start cheating with your architecture. You can't like sneak in a little model code in the view, maybe, you know, just this once, because we have to ship this feature. No, because if it's an open source project, it's decoupled, it's used by other people, and you have more clear separation of concerns. Another way I think about it is that if I have a problem that I have to solve multiple times, chances are pretty big that someone else will have to solve this problem as well. So why not just share my, my, my implementation? Maybe some people have some feedback on it, maybe we can improve it together, and everyone will win. And finally, one, imp one important point I want to make is that I really think that simultaneous innovation is completely OK. What I mean by that is that I see a lot of times when people will publish an open source project, and the first reaction will be, well, this already exists. Here is a, a project that already does it. Well, guess what? Doesn't matter. If you have a project that you wrote that you think could contribute to the community, don't worry so much if there's already something that does something slightly similar. Publish it and see where it goes. I think it's really dangerous for us to settle down on a standard too early. I think having some simultaneous innovation, especially in a new language like Swift or Kotlin, is really great because we can see all the different, different implementations, all the different perspectives, and then eventually we can settle on a standard. All right, so those are some of the kind of ways to identify a project to open source, but what are some other things that are good to keep in mind? Well, first of all, I really recommend to start with the simplest possible API. You know, a simple API surface, you know, it doesn't do too much, it's much easier to maintain. And to do that, I think it's good to just focus on solving one problem or one task at a time. Just again, like I, how I got started with my update lookup, it just did one thing. I mean, it was just one class that just checked if you have an update available on the App Store. I think that's a good kind of project to get started with. It's also important, I think, to decide on a scope and to design some limitations. Because especially if you will have other users of this open source project later, people will come in with different requirements and different feature requests. So if you instead decide on a scope and stick to it, it will be much easier to maintain. I think the easiest way to do this is to define the scope and usage with a clear readme, code examples, and a solid suite of tests. That way you are very clearly signaling to the outside world what this project is meant to do and nothing more. I think Felix Klause usually uh, makes the example that some people want Fastlane to brew them coffee in the morning. But you know, that's not really what Fastlane is for, right? 
The final thing is that I really want to encourage everybody to try to be welcoming and supportive of users and contributors. People might have feedback, people might disagree with you and have improvement suggestions, but try to be as welcoming and, and warm and fuzzy as you can, because it helps build your own little mini community around your project, and you can end up having people contribute to it and help you fix bugs. So that's my tips around open source. Now let's talk about blogging. So when I write on my blog and when I create new posts, I have some, a three set of principles that I always try to keep in mind. And I call these three principles the three Fs. Now, I know that an F word is not really something positive. So let's try to redefine the F word a little bit here, or I'm going to give you three new F words, actually. So what are these three Fs? Well, they are focus, that's the first one, format, and framing. I always try to keep these things in mind whenever I work on my blog. And for me, it really helps me to stay focused and to stay narrow in my scope so I can keep producing new content every single week. So let's go through them and what they exactly mean. Well, let's start with focus. What does it mean, really? Well, for me, it means that I want to make sure to keep writing short and focused posts because they're much, much easier to read and they're also much easier to write. Instead of trying to like, write the big, big thing with lots of information and it covers everything from you know, the whole planet Earth, I try to just stick to one single thing and write about it. I focus on making a single point. And that is, takes a lot of restraint, because sometimes you, know, you do some research and you write about something, and then you want to make another point and another point, but sticking just to one point makes it much, much easier both to read and write. One thing I really did in the beginning, I think I still have about like 50, 55 unfinished drafts in Medium that I never ended up publishing. And you know what was in common, all of these drafts, what they had in common? They all started with a table of contents. Like the first thing was table of contents. But if a blog post needs to have a table of contents, it's probably a little bit too long and a little bit too large in scope. It's going to take a long time to edit and a long time to publish. And chances are that by the time you're finished, you have already moved on to something else or you've already bored of this topic. So it's better to try to write more short and focused posts. The second thing is format. With formats, I think you can take so many different ways, and there are so many different formats you can use. So the most important thing is to find something that works for you. Just because it works for someone else doesn't mean that it will work for you. And that means that you need to experiment, ask for feedback, and keep iterating. Ask friends and coworkers to read your work, come with good constructive feedback, try to iterate on it, and experiment and try new things. When it comes to format, I think that keeping with a few clear examples really goes a long way to make your point. Just like how I don't want to make like a ton of different points in one blog post, I don't want to have too many examples either. And this again can be very tempting because you come up with new use cases for the thing you're writing about. But trying to stick to a few clear examples goes a long, long way. And as humans, we are these days, you know, in the smartphone era, we are very, very used to zoning out. Like if something doesn't entertain us within the first 30 seconds, we're just gone. And for that, I use visual anchor points, things like headings, code samples, and images, and you mix them up to enable people to more easily read and focus their attention. I want to show you an example for one of my recent blog posts, just to kind of show you how I think about these things. So here's one recent post that I write, like an excerpt. And as you can see here, what I do is that I start with a heading, I write like one or two sentences, then a code sample, one or two sentences again, another code sample, and so on. That keeps things a little bit more varied. It's way easier to edit, it's much easier to write, and it's easier to read. So again, I try to constrain myself and restrain myself to make things easier both to publish and to read. So the final thing is framing. So what does that mean? Well, I think framing is extremely important with anything you do in regards to sharing. What I mean by that is that it comes a lot down to presentation and how that really guides people's perception of your work. Again, like I mentioned earlier, there's this kind of pressure to be an expert in whatever you're going to talk about. You know, you need to be like super good and well rehearsed and everything needs to, you know, you need to know everything about the single topic. But I really don't think you need to be an expert. Just don't pretend to be one. You, know, don't, you don't have to act like an expert. It's fine, completely fine, to say, you know, I'm not an expert, I'm a beginner, I'm learning this thing, and let's learn it together. And if you start thinking about it this way, well, potential topics to write about, they are everywhere. In your daily work, in the problems you're solving, in the bugs you're fixing, anything that is, you know, 
a little bit more complicated and hard that you had to solve for a couple of days, it's definitely worth sharing. And the final point here is that I always try to share learnings and experiences instead of selling things. Like, I, I never want to write a post that's called, like, why you should use RxSwift or why you should use RxJava. And I see a lot of posts that end with the sentence, I hope I convinced you to use this technology. But why try to convince anybody? Instead, try to focus on sharing learnings and sharing experiences. And if people want to use it, they will. If not, maybe they learn something about it. So that's blogging. And finally, I want to talk about podcasting. Now, this is a, like a little bit more niche format. And when I got started with podcasting, it was, like I mentioned, very scary. And I didn't really know how to get started. But the funny thing about podcasting is that if you start thinking about it, what is a podcast really? Like, what is it really about? Well, it's just people talking. It's just a recording of a conversation that people are having. That's all it is. So it's very, very simple conceptually. But the good news is that it's also very simple technically. A podcast is nothing magical. It's really just an MP3 file, an RSS feed that you put on the internet. That's all it is. And to, to produce these MP3 files, you can use free tools like QuickTime or platforms that are online called Cast to easily record what you want to do. And you can put your podcast in many different platforms, including Squarespace, SoundCloud, and Podbean, which makes it way more easier to distribute it. And podcasts are a super open, kind of democratized format, which means that there's no platform lock-in, there's nowhere you need to go to publish it, you just put it online as an RSS feed, and people can subscribe to it. Now, when I create podcasts, I use the same three Fs that I talked about earlier with blogging. I want to create shows that are focused and have a you know, clear, clear uh, format, and I want to make sure to use the right framing to give people the right expectations. So, if you're thinking about, you know, maybe I should try this out, maybe I should see if I can start a podcast, here are some tips. First off, is it's a great opportunity to team up with others and to, you know, make something fun together. Maybe you'll meet some people here at this conference and maybe you just want to start, you know, talking about your programming language or some framework you're interested in and share it with others. Maybe you want to make a podcast in your company about some of the things you're doing and again, share it and see what's going to happen. And because it's a new format, relatively speaking, especially if we compare it to blogging, there is so, many, so much room for new ideas and new concepts. And really, you could start something which is, you know, had list, has literally never been done before, pretty, pretty simple, because there are so many niche ways to do things. Now, the good news is that you don't need an rec expensive recording studio. You only need like a pretty decent microphone, it doesn't cost that much, and you can just start recording your conversations. That's really all you need to do, and it's easy to get started. Now, one thing that really was uh, scary for me when I got started with this was the concept of audio editing. And, but the, the thing is that basic audio editing is quite easy to learn, and you can even use free tools like Audacity and GarageBand to edit your show. Now, when I make a podcast, I make a lot of errors on, on air when I'm recording. I like accidentally cough, or I have to think about something for a minute, or you know, the, the, the conversation gets derailed and we end up you know, talking about something completely different. But the good news is you can fix that in post. <laughs> so in your audio editor, you can easily make a lot of cuts. In fact, here is a recent episode of Stack Trace. You can see all the different cuts here that I've been making. And this is really what makes it sound more fluent, even though you know, it's, it makes us sound more smart than we are, basically. <laughs> and that's a great way to, thing to keep in mind, is that it's not live. You can always edit things after the fact. So today we've talked about four different topics around sharing. To set yourself some good goals, to realize why you want to share things in the first place, to get started with open source by sharing some of the modules or pieces of code that you have that are more generic and can actually be extracted from your project. To, to start blogging by setting yourself some goals again, having a clear format, a clear focus, and good framing. And maybe try out podcasting just for fun to see where it goes. Now, I want to wrap up with two things. The first thing is that 
you don't have to share things to be a good developer. I think this is really important to point out. And it's a very, very common to think that just because you know, people are sharing things, it automatically makes them better developers. Well, sharing things and being a developer are two different things, but you can become a better developer and learn more things by sharing. So I think that it's a really nice thing. Another thing to keep in mind is that, again, with this expert thing, I think a lot of people feel like, well, what do I have to bring to the mix? And I definitely felt like that in the beginning. Why should I start sharing things? Because I'm just one developer you know, working in this project. What do I have to contribute? Well, here's what I think about that. I think that whoever you are and wherever you are, you have a very unique perspective. Everyone has an individual, unique perspective. And whether you have 10 days or you have 10 years of programming experience, I think that is worth sharing. Thank you very much.